This episode of the Mega Meeple is brought to you by our supporters over at Pod Pledge. Welcome to the Mega Meeple, the show all about gamers and the games that bring them together. This is episode 35. So, yeah, we're uh, we're getting better. <laughs> we're, and I hope you uh, notice some of the, the differences from last episode. It because uh, making a, a big leap forward in how the podcast is not only being recorded. But also how it's processed and, and post-production and mixing. Uh, as uh, you may have noticed the last episode, the interviews are now being done via Skype versus uh, a recorded telephone call. And I'm sure uh, you will agree with me that the audio is a lot better. So I think we're going to proceed with that from now on. Unless, of course, our guest uh, does not have access to Skype or uh, you know, if the phone is more uh, convenient for them. Then uh, we'll do it by phone. But any other case, uh, we're going to be doing uh, our interviews by Skype now. So I've, I've been using GarageBand to do all the uh, post-production stuff, and I uh, I also have a uh, music recording studio. But I use uh, I, I use a DAW, the DAW. For those of you who don't know, that stands for a Digital Audio Workstation, and it's uh, apparently is things like. Uh, Logic or Pro Tools, or what what I use is uh, Persona Studio One Three Pro. Uh, sounds fancy, but it's it's just it's it's, it's just the the, uh, the Pro version uh, of Persona Studio One uh, Version Three that has all the whistles and bells and uh, options available to it. It's not a demo. But uh, in messing around with that and recording some songs, I, I just started to think about, well, I wonder if I could you know, start using Personas to record and, and mix. So I was, uh, while I was uh, one day just uh, taking some time off and messing around with my guitar and bass and, and, and uh, recording some stuff down, laying some tracks down, I just began to wonder, it's like, well, you know, Instead of using GarageBand, wouldn't I be able to use Personas to do the the podcast as far as like recording and then uh, all the the post production stuff? Cause it uh, tell you compared to GarageBand, Personas has a lot more you know options uh, and things that you could do to really you know trick the the audio out and have some fun with it. I thought, well, yeah, why, why not? Because after all, isn't that what a podcast is? Is one big long song? So uh, yeah, we we started doing that uh, last episode. So hopefully you uh, noticed uh, some some improvements in the uh, not only the recording quality, but also the uh, uh, the the mixing and and post stuff that uh, hopefully shown through. So yeah, uh, as I said, for very back uh, about eight nine months ago, this is an ever evolving, ever growing thing, and uh, we're just gonna learn and grow and improve as we go along. And uh, I'm gonna talk more about how I'm achieving that, and uh, to that end uh, later on in uh, some some of my thoughts in the uh, in this episode. But uh, first of all, we had the, the 2018 is uh, kicked off pretty well uh, as far as games go. So uh, let's talk about some cool news items that's uh, announced since uh, the beginning of the year. In the news. Yes, that's a little... Well... Actually, if uh, if you follow uh, the Mega Meeple on our Twitter and Facebook, uh, we, we primarily use Twitter and Facebook for r- real quick, uh, impromptu 
uh, news postings and retweets and shares and stuff like that. So if you want to, typically we'll share some newsworthy or brand new or breaking news type things uh, on our Twitter and Facebook. And then maybe about a day or two later, I will have uh, something written up and posted on the the website, on the news page on the website. Um, Because I I like to type those up, uh, give it a little bit of my uh, personal flair to it. Uh, rather than just uh, like a simple copy and paste of what everybody else, you know, every other Tom, Dick, and Harry is reporting out there. So, yeah, if you want to uh, get some uh, quick uh, breaking latest news, uh, make sure to tw- uh, follow us on the Twitter and the Facebook. And then uh, I will expound on some of those things that I think are a little bit more newsworthy that interests me particularly i will post in the news page on the website so make sure you to uh, check that and you subscribe uh for for email updates and stuff uh on as far as when we post things to the to the website but uh yeah this year started off pretty pretty well when uh jamie stigmeyer and i'm going to be uh, talking about charterstone here later on in, in the episode because we just started to play that, but uh, Jamie announced the the last and final expansion to Scythe uh, called Rise of Fenris. Yeah, so uh, according to uh, the Stonemeyer Games website, uh, Scythe: The Rise of Fenris uh, is the conclusion of the Scythe expansion trilogy. Now it enables uh, two different options for any player count. Uh, if you just have the Scythe core box, uh, you could one to five players or uh, expand it to one to seven players if you have the invaders from afar uh, expansion and there's two uh, two modes of play there's the campaign which uh, encompasses eight games and then there's a modular and it has 11 modules that you could play for and uh, the story of of scythe continues and concludes with an eight episode campaign uh, now, while the campaign includes surprises, unlocks, and, and persistent elements, it is fully resettable and replayable. So, even when you get to the end of the campaign, you can still replay it and uh, get, you know, it's not like a play it once and done deal, put it away, that's it. And then you have the uh, modular. Uh, now, instead of or after the campaign, the new modules and the Rise of Fenris uh, can be used in various combinations to cater to player preferences. Now, these modules are fully compatible with all Scythe expansions. And that's including the, the Wind Gambit, which, uh, which is the, the most recent expansion with the airships, which if you haven't already uh, checked that stuff, that, that, that's, that's a cool dynamic that has been added to the game. Now, uh, at the time that they uh, released the, uh, the the press release, uh, they have not revealed uh, like the exact nature of the episodes or the modules. That uh, some of the components in these modules are in uh, secret tuck boxes. So, like similar to the Charter Stone, you have these little tuck boxes and stuff in there that you don't open until you're prompted to do so. Now, again, uh, Jamie is not going through a Kickstarter to do this. Uh, this is going to be uh, available at retailers and, and gaming stores uh, in the uh, third quarter of this year. Another thing is uh, just just recently uh, announced, uh, just shortly before we started recording, is that uh, Great Western Trail is going to have its first expansion later this year. It's going to be called Rails to the North. Now, for those of you who have not heard of Great Western Trail, uh, first of all, where the heck have you been? It is... <laughs> A popular, it's a popular uh, Euro and deck building game, and uh, actually, it, it, at least in my local area, it, it's it's kind of hard to come by because uh, every time they get a shipment in, it it's gone. You know, a lot of the uh, online uh, retailers uh, have been out of stock on this thing for quite a while because it's so popular. The core box, the core game. Uh, it's a like I said, it's a combination of Euro points collecting and uh, deck building. Uh, each player uh, journeys their way up into a, a, an evolving board, uh, hoping to have the, the finest hand of cattle cards by the time they reach Kansas City. 
and then send them off on a train for good old uh, victory points at the end of the game. Now along the trail are location tiles that are randomized for each game, uh, which uh, keeps things uh, constantly fresh and uh, a lot of uh, replayability on that. Now, it sounds like that the game's first expansion may explore pastures beyond Texas uh, to Kansas. Again, the expansion is called Rails in the North, hinting at the, the deeper involvement with the rail system, which currently allows players to claim stations and advance their train around the track to collect more points each time they complete that path. Now, the expansion is due out in the middle of 2018, and uh, Great Western Trail publisher Pegasus Spiel uh, will uh, uh, supposedly uh, supposed to confirm what's in store with this new expansion by the end of this month. So keep an eye and ear out for that. Well, it, it had to happen sooner or later. Finally, zombies have invaded the tiny epic universe. Uh, gambling Games... I uh, have uh, launched their Kickstarter for Tiny Epic Zombies. And, and of course, it funded like almost immediately. The project goal was uh, like 15000 and already uh, like 355000 in change has uh, been pledged. So, And there's still like 20 days left in the, in the campaign. So yeah, th that, that uh, funded real quick. And uh, it also it's going to use the... Uh, the Meeples are going to be able to... Uh, uh, be equipped with things like chainsaws and shotguns and baseball bats and if you haven't seen the trailer kickstarter trailer t to this you got to check it out cuz it is freaking hilarious uh, I, but, yeah uh, well, and of course we'll we'll put a link to all these things in the show notes of this episode but yeah if, you, if even if you don't like tiny epic stuff or you have no plans on you gotta at least watch the trailer to the kickstarter because it is it is funny and then uh, another thing on kickstarter the the powerhouse that is simon games have uh launched and obviously successfully uh, funded uh the hate game now this game if 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 board games have like ratings like they do for uh movies uh th this game would most like you know, it would be rated R. In fact, it says on the uh, the uh, Kickstarter that uh, this is rated M uh, mature for eighteen plus. Uh, according to the the Kickstarter notes, uh, the world of hate is brutal and is recommended for mature audiences only. The art of the game depicts acts of extreme violence as well as nudity. To survive and thrive in this barren wasteland, you'll need to embrace the savagery of not only massacring your enemies, but taking innocents captive, torturing them, and even feasting off their flesh. You've been warned, this is not a world for the faint of heart. Uh, because of that, uh, the, the mature content level, the Simon has decided to make the entire hate board game is, the, the entire thing is Kickstarter exclusive. So that's the only, really the only way you're going to be able to get a hold of the game. Uh, and there's not like a half a dozen different options or tiers that you have to, to choose from. You either pledge to uh, get the game or you don't. Uh, so the entire thing is, is just just one pledge level for the game and all the stretch goals, and that's it. Which uh, I guess kind of flies in the face of the whole thing about Kickstarter not being a store. And Al and I have uh, talked about that in a previous episode. I mean, hell, they uh, they made a, a big stink about uh, violence in video games. So uh, I think uh, that's, that needs to be at least talked about and examined more as far as uh, violence in board games. And just just how far is too far. So yeah, the uh, the past few weeks, uh, at least after uh, the first of the year, have been pretty busy here at the uh, Mega Meeple Studios. I have been uh, consulting with other people in the uh, the gaming podcast community or industry or what, however you want to put it. And I I uh, had read somewhere, I think it was a I think it was a Twitter link to an article 
not specifically the, the podcast, but just content creation in general. But one of the things that uh, they talked about that content creators uh, should do, but many of them are not, is uh, seeking input from other content creators who are in uh, not only your specific uh, sphere of media, you know, be it video or radio or podcast or TV or whatever, but uh, also... So I did that. I had contacted uh, a few other uh, podcast content creators in the gaming world uh, that I had uh, I'd listened to their podcast. I enjoy and like what they do with their stuff and just uh, offered out an invitation for them to listen to a few episodes of uh, The Mega Meeple and give us uh, their, their feedback and their advice. And I received back uh, quite a bit of positive uh, encouragement and feedback as far as uh, things that uh, they they listened to and heard that they they uh, felt that we were doing right and uh, on the right path at least here at the Mega Meeple and gave us some pointers and uh, advice on how to how to tweak this show on to make it uh, more listener friendly and more approachable and more just uh, enjoyable to listen to and you have heard uh, me implement those suggestions and ideas uh, specifically in the past I'd say uh, two or so episodes prior to this one so I'm taking uh, uh, qu- quite a bit of that um, not all but uh, quite a bit of their feedback and advice and pointers uh to heart and implementing them here right away and i'm sure you uh, heard the uh, the the improvements and the differences in uh, the episodes as of just recently give a particular shout out and thank you to the crew over at the of dyson men podcast uh th- those guys were p- particularly very helpful so i want to give a uh, big thank you and shout out to them if you haven't checked out their podcast, uh, get, go over and give them a listen. I'll, I'll, of course, I'll put a I'll put a link to all these things in the show notes. So uh, just go to our website, uh, www.themegameeple.com, and uh, all the uh, episodes to a podcast is on our podcast page, as well along with all the links and show notes to that particular episode. So you could go all the way back to, you know the very first episode we ever did in fact now I, I i almost don't want to go back and listen to the very first episode because i know at, at the point we are now and how much we've grown and improved uh i'm gonna go back and listen I, I, i'm just gonna win <laughs> it's like oh god that sounds terrible what the hell was i thinking well you know the, the, what i was thinking was let's do this let's go out and let's venture out into the podcast wilderness and uh, see uh, see what happens. And uh, we will just learn and grow as we do it. Which really, you know, if you think about it, that's, that's how uh, a lot of growth and improvements occur is by just get, getting out there, trying it, doing it. You know, you make a mistake, you... you, you you get feedback, you learn from that, and you make the, the, the adjustments and the improvements, and you move on. And like I said, you, you improve and evolve as a podcast. Now, if you haven't seen already, uh, the Mega Meeple is, uh, we, we, have a, we have a Patreon page, uh, but uh, since then we have uh, signed on with Pod Pledge, and uh, that is a it's it's not specifically for podcasts. I mean, it's for all kinds of content creators. That one in particular, I think uh, I get a lot more out of because of just the, the support that is available there. Uh, and the fact that it was uh, created and developed by none other than Chaz Marler of uh, Pair of Dice Paradise. And if you are if ever watched any of the, the Dice Tower uh, shows and videos on YouTube, you've seen him. He's a contributor for the, uh, the to the uh, Dice Tower. And he also has his own YouTube uh, channel. Of, uh, again, it's called Pair of Dice Paradise. 
and uh, we had, uh, in fact, we had our very first live chat uh, about a, a week and a half or so ago. So one of the cool things about uh, getting in on a, on a, a platform uh, early on on the ground level is you just, as, as it grows and more people come on, you just kind of ride that crest. And uh, as uh, new people come on, even if they're they're brand new to the whole content creation uh, world, uh, you could uh, offer support and encouragement to them and pass on what you've learned in your uh, your path to putting out via either a podcast or videos or YouTubes or what have you. But we had, uh, Chaz had their, their first uh, Pod Pledge live chat uh, about a week or so ago. And I, I think I was the only one there. So I think mean, Chaz had a, a, a cool speech or presentation about uh, finding your purpose. Uh, what, what is the purpose of your, your show or your, uh, proje- your project? And to dig really, uh, dig deeper into what the purpose is rather than just what it is. You know, I, I talk about, you know, the Mega Meat Boy is a podcast, uh, uh, you know, all about gamers and games that bring them together, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that that's, that's sort of like, that's what we are. That's what the podcast is. But what is its purpose? So he uh, challenged us to, to just really think, go deeper in uh, what, uh, why it is uh, we, we do what we do. It, it basically it basically turned into uh, the latter half as I was like a it was like a one on one consultation with the uh, jazz. Big uh, shout out to uh, the guys of the Dyson Men podcast that uh, gave me some direct feedback on this show, and also to uh, Chaz Mahler to creating the, the the Pod Pledge platform for those of us who want to have a, an alternative option to to Patreon. We do have a Patreon thing, but it's pretty much identical to the project that I have on Pop Pledge. So which, whichever one uh, people feel comfortable or more familiar with, you know, but both of those options are available to you if you want to uh, pitch in a dollar or so a month or per episode or however you want to do it uh, to, to help support the show. And again, that just uh, a lot of it just goes towards uh, hosting costs with... Uh, the website and uh, Lipsyn. Well, I've been busy uh, the the past, I guess, few weeks. Actually, almost a month now. I'd uh, received uh, one of my Kickstarters from Awakened Realms called Lords of Hellas, and uh, that that is just a, a, that's a really cool game. Think of uh, uh, area control uh, worker placement uh, meets uh, Greek mythology and the Greek gods, and there's battles and monsters and stuff like that that you have to to fight, and you could uh, battle other other your opponents. Uh, to gain control of certain uh, areas or regions, regions and lands, and there's four different ways to win the game. And I did a uh, I did an unboxing video right away. Uh, that that video just exploded. I mean, uh, I think uh, at current time after about three weeks of being on YouTube, uh, that that has well over I want to say almost three thousand views on it, and a, a, a pretty good healthy percentage of watch time as far as minutes so that is really just <laughs> that just exploded on on the uh our youtube channel and considering that our our youtube channel is uh, majority of videos that we have on there now get maybe a you know a few, a few hundred views uh to all of a sudden have one video that just shoots up you know, close to three thousand now after about a month. People like the unboxing. I gave, I put out a feeler out there if people want to see a rules video or a how to play video, because uh, it yeah it doesn't look like uh, Rodney Smith is doing one for this game. So it's like well, and and the thing is, I, I looked on to see what was available out there, and as of right now, 
pretty much all of the playthroughs or how to play type things are a few months old. So they are using prototype of the game. They're using a uh, a whip or as, as they say, a, a work in progress draft of the rules. Uh, they're not using the final production of the game. So I figure, well, not not. The, the Kickstarter has been released. It's, it's being delivered now to the, the backers. So we now have a, a final published version of the game and the rules. And as it is, you know, the, the prototypes are not going to be this. They are not the same as the final production of the game. The rules certainly are not the, the same as the final edit uh, of the rule book. These videos were doing their rules and playthroughs uh, based on the draft of the rules. And there, there is, uh, and Awakened Realms put out one video uh, on, on how to play, but it, the audio on it is, is just uh, absolutely atrocious. Uh, it, 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 it sounds and looks like it was filmed in somebody's garage and you can't hear anything of what they're saying or you can't see the, the, the board very well. I set out to record a rules how to play video on on this game, and I, I recorded. Uh, uh, gladly, I didn't get too far into the actual filming of it, and I uh, went to. Uh, I downloaded the uh, footage onto my computer, opened up my Final Cut Pro, and was looking at the footage, and was like, you know what, this, this sucks. Uh, this is this is no better than the, this the stuff that's out there now and it all, all had to do uh, with the lighting so it's like well if I'm going to do this I'm going to do this right to the best of my ability so I took uh, my mouse to Amazon and uh, did some uh, research and I finally uh, uh, I pulled the plug and I ordered a, a two light LED setup studio setup Got a pair of a uh, newer uh, light uh, studio light system, uh, uh, complete with the, the the battery packs and the light stands and so forth. And uh, let me tell you, those 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 sons of guns are bright. It's like, <laughs> you you can uh, you do not want to look directly into those suckers. Even uh, they they even they they come with a, a diffused filter that you put in. in in front of the the light, and even with those, those are you know shoot those th those things up to ninety nine percent. It because uh, that's as high as it goes. They get you know I guess the 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 LED readout doesn't go to three digits. It could only go up to ninety nine, which is you know it's a hundred. You know who's who's kidding who? But yeah, that that those those things are real bright. So I went back and re recorded all the footage. Uh, that I deleted because of a lighting issue. And, yeah, it looks a heck of a lot better. It's very clear. So I'm able to get uh, some good quality lights. And uh, just in the process now of editing it together, I'm going to record a voiceover. So we have uh, not not doing the uh, mic on the cameras. It's a two-camera setup. So I'll be able to... Uh, edit back and forth between uh, uh, close-ups and uh, wide shots and let me let me tell you that that is a lot of that's a lot of work uh, the, the, in fact I, I tweeted out a picture of uh, uh, the the uh, the studio setup uh, where I think I was took a picture of one of the setups while I was filming and I, I tweeted it out and I basically said you know Rodney Smith does not get paid enough to do this crap and in fact and Rodney liked it and he uh, responded uh, said keep it up you got this so <laughs> that's it's good I got uh, some some encouragement uh, from Rodney Smith himself from watch it played so that, that that was much appreciated so yes thank you Rodney I, I am going to keep it up so I <laughs> appreciate the uh the slap on the back and the thumbs up. So uh, hope I, I I doubt if it's gonna be up to the caliber of what you do, 
But then again, hey, this is going to be my very first rules video, so... But you got to start somewhere. Well, uh, I, the, the Charterstone game has been sitting on my shelf since November of last year. And uh, finally was able to get to, to the table. And we got, uh, I was hoping to get a six-player game, but we got close. We got, we got a five-player game on the first mission. And so this uh, is not going to be a spoiler thing. It's going to be spoiler-free. And since uh, we've only played the first mission, and there's 12 of them, uh, I guess you could uh, say this is not so much a review, but it's uh, it's going to be a, like a first impressions. But anyway, uh, we started uh, last night uh, to play Charterstone. We got uh, five people together to play it, and we're going to... The way we scheduled that with... Because uh, a lot of our friends have other gaming nights and RPG nights that they're involved with, so rather than uh, just uh, cram everybody's already busy week schedule, uh, we're going to uh, have every two weeks get together, have a uh, play Charterstone. Hopefully by uh, mission three or four or so, hopefully sooner than that, uh, we'll have a good core group of people that uh, consistently want to come and play every every two weeks and see this through all, all the uh, 12 missions. But my first impression after playing the first game at Charterstone is, uh, no, number one, the, the art is pretty cool. Each uh, persona in the, in the Charter, each one has its own uh, you know, ethnic uh, presentation. So you have all kinds of different people and uh, groups and ethnic origins, uh, personas in this game. And the fact that as the game plays, uh, this, this whole board is evolving into its own unique uh, player board, which, uh, as I understand it, when, when all 12 uh, games are done, uh, you will have a, a, a board that is unique to just you and that initial group of people that you play the game through with. Uh, and the, the decision that we made as a as a group, so it's like a, a it's like everybody is involved in building this world together. So I'm excited to see how 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 this uh, world develops and evolves, and what the uh, the final you know result is. In fact, uh, if you go to our uh, Twitter and Instagram pages, uh, I, what I'm going to be doing is is posting a, a before and after picture of the board before we even started game one which is just a blank board and then uh, i posted a uh, picture of what our board looks like after game one so i'll do that after each game you know i'll post a picture on our, our twitter and instagram of uh what uh, how our board game is developing uh after each mission and i'm thinking too of getting another group together to play like a, a separate series you know the, the separate uh game of Charterstone uh, on the opposite side of the board and then um, I'm thinking of if, if I could do that after both groups finish their 12 missions uh, get together for uh, one last like a 13th mission type of thing and uh, each group will play the other group's board one time and then see how that goes but uh, right now, I just have the one group uh, on Thursday, every other Thursday night, playing through uh, Charterstone. I I can't imagine just the amount of time and just cognitive effort it takes to put something that complex of a game together. Because, you know, certain cards that you play or certain actions you take or a, a, a crate that you're you're able to open, uh, it dictates specific uh, specific cards you take out of the index, 
and even some components that you take out of the box. Uh, there's a, a series of four boxes with Roman numerals on them, one to four, and uh, based on <laughs> based on what uh, crate uh, you you would open uh, could trigger that uh, you would uh, unlock some of the components in, in those boxes as well, not just the cards. And then just just the fun that we had in naming our our personas and uh, naming our charters and so forth. Uh, we we just had a lot of <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah, quite quite a bit of uh, a geeky and nerdy references uh, that were just uh, called out and 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 made as we were naming our personas and our charters and so forth. Um, now I I did set up a uh, a, a video, so I did videotape uh, our play and uh, thinking of, of putting it out because the game's been out for a while. They get up putting those videos out as a playthrough. And of course those videos will be spoilers in them. But yeah, I, I have to I have to go through uh the raw footage right now and I'm I may have to do some pretty heavy <laughs> heavy editing to it because uh <laughs> we, Yeah, the the, the, the the group that I the group of at least this particular group that I, I game with our, our sense of humor is pretty warped, so if I'm if I'm thinking of putting this stuff on the Mega Meeple YouTube channel, and I want to keep uh, a uh, a family friendly uh, atmosphere and content on the YouTube channel as I as I do here on the on the podcast, yeah, I'm gonna have to edit out some some blocks of footage there from the <laughs> from the video, and. Uh, Try to splice them together so it's, it's some kind of coherency. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. So anyway, yeah, check check that out, uh, or keep a lookout for that on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, the the rules video for Lords of Hellas. Uh, if, if you have gotten that game or if you kickstarted that, and you're still waiting for it to be delivered. Uh, make sure you go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there. So. Uh, you will get notified when all this stuff gets uploaded. But yeah, for for the first uh, first few minutes or so, just getting uh, going through all the cards that uh, go through the rules, and, and me, I I really enjoyed it because it piecemeals the rules as like a need to know basis. It just gives you the rule bit by bit what you need to know in order to take the next few steps. And then once you take an action that triggers something else, another mechanic that uh, con- that gets introduced because of that action, then you, you'll you read a series of cards to uh, explain uh, the rules that apply to that me- that particular mechanic. That That is a really, really, really good way to teach a game to people uh, it, it forces people to focus on what the mechanic that is being explained right now that applies to this particular point in the game rather than worrying about something that you don't need to worry about right now because it's not even in play right now. And for someone like me who, if uh, people interrupt me with uh, questions that uh, I, I get sidetracked on you know answering their questions, and then it takes me a while to to figure out okay what was I talking about again what what was I explaining and trying to get back on track on what I was saying before the question came up, so yeah, pe- <laughs> but hey you know it's like there's a reason why rule books, well let me let me qualify that there's a reason why good quality rule books are written a certain way because. There is a, uh, a, I guess a, a process, an order of learning certain rules in a certain order. It doesn't do any good to ask a question that's covered in page eight when you still need to focus on learning the rules that are on page three. So that whole uh, piecemeal of pulling out specific cards uh, in the beginning and only reading and understanding and learning the those specific mechanics and the rules to those mechanics 
right now that you need to know to play right now uh, is is a really really cool way to to teach the game. And as you, as you play the game, uh, you know you just build upon that as as new cards and new rules and new mechanics are introduced to the game. Particularly exciting uh, for our group that once uh, people start building their buildings and placing new buildings onto their charter because it's like oh cool what all right we have a new option available to us now it's like okay cool what does this do typically when when somebody uh, builds a new building in their charter that that's usually like one of the first first things everybody wants to go to all right let, let's I would, I would put my worker there now and, and everybody's kind of bumping each other off to get to that new building now, luckily, uh, I guess this is sort of like the benefit of waiting a few months uh, before starting the game after it's uh, been released. Is uh, since it's released, uh, they have posted on Stonemaier Games website the uh, an FAQ and uh, just a not a rata. It, it's it's more of a like a clarification of the rules and uh, the automa, and it's it's broken down in sections of. Okay, read this section before you play game one, and then read this section after you play game one. And it's just a, a good rundown of clarifications of the rules uh, and certain uh, terms that are used in the game that, uh, that may, may or may not be fully understood by the way the cards are, are worded. And really, I, th- I think the only errata that it needs to be done to the chronicle is the fact that uh when drawing from the cards that have like the uh the constructed buildings and the uh, the assistants and so forth that you're only allowed to draw the cards that are face up uh you cannot draw from the uh the face down deck I'm going to invest in some whiteout. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a that's a good thing. Is like get, get some whiteout. So that way if, if someone makes a mistake and, and marks something up or fills something in that wasn't supposed to be done because we misunderstood the rules, then we could, uh, you know, neg that and correct that. And Yeah, but ba- based on just after the, the playing the first mission, my, my first impressions of Charterstone uh, at least, and uh, not only mine, but uh, everybody in uh, our group that played it, we we really enjoyed it. Uh, we're excited to see uh, how the board develops and what new things are introduced to the game. And there were, there were numerous times during the game where I mean, the, the we everybody just busted out laughing because there was there was a mechanic or introduction. To something or element of the game that was introduced or unlocked that we thought was just so wild and so cool, and really, uh, Charterstone is is really I think the the only legacy the the first and only legacy uh, game that I played because I'm not OCD but I I have a lot of games I'm invested uh, a lot of time and money in those and I like to take care of my toys so if there's any that's why I never really liked like or got into a legacy stuff. I just don't like the thought of my games and my toys that I take so much care and pride in and take care of includes you know marking something up or ripping something apart or or in any way kind of defacing the 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 game. So Charterstone is the first legacy game uh, style game that I've I've played. Now that's not to mean that I'm all for legacy games now, but that's just saying that the way Charterstone does legacy, uh, I think, is the one time that I, I, I actually would enjoy playing a legacy style game. So based based at least on on the first mission, uh, yeah, we're we're digging this game. Very excited to see how the board evolves and uh, what. Uh, be interested to see what the the final product will uh, will be. So that is my first impressions of Charter Stone. Well, 
Well, this episode's guest is James Wilson, who is uh, the designer of a uh, game that is just just about to finish up on Kickstarter. But James and I had a, a pr- really good conversation about the game, and uh, so let's go to that right now. All right, welcome back to the Mega Meeple, and uh, we have as our guest in this episode... James Wilson, who is the uh, designer of a, well, it's it's a success. It is going to be uh, published and released because it's a, success, a successful Kickstarter. Uh, it's it, like uh, funded in under six hours. So, uh, but we have uh, James Wilson, designer of Everdell. How you doing, James? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me. So tell us uh, about yourself and, and how you got into gaming and uh, just uh, what was what was it that uh, I, I call this the the, uh, the barroom napkin question. Uh, what uh, what spurred the uh, the idea behind Neverdell? Sure. Yeah. Uh, for those that are interested in a more thorough answer, if you go over to, to Board Game Geek, I have two rather extensive and maybe embarrassingly long designer diaries that I've posted on there. Uh, if you want, you know, a cozy read, you can go through those and see more detail. But I can kind of give you a basic gist. So um, back in 2009, I purchased Carcassonne. And that started it, ah. basically, in a nutshell. Um, up until that point, you know, I played board games off and on growing up, and it was your typical fair that everyone's used to, Monopoly and uh, Scrabble and whatnot and whatnot. Um, I did get into miniatures for just a little tiny bit with the uh, Lord of the Rings miniature, but never really kind of found that thing that just made me stick with it and really love it. A friend told me about Catan, uh, but at the time, it was just my wife and I that would really be able to play much, and of course, Catan is three-player. Um, I found this guy on the internet called Tom Vassell. Don't know if he's still around or not, but uh, Mr. Vassell, of course, had numerous games at the time, and I was led to Carcassonne. Um, yeah, we bought Carcassonne in 2009, and that really started it, and from there is... Same story as a lot of people, just kind of snowballed, picking up lots and lots and lots of games as time went on. Kind of your staples, Ticket to Ride, Dominion, Stone Age, et cetera, et cetera, Pandemic, those sorts of things. And we just loved it. You know, just loved it. It was something totally different for for games. Um, I was into video games at the time, kind of wanting to phase out of them, really. And uh, board games, which is a great thing to get into, especially, you know, these type of games that I just did not know about at the time. And my wife loved them, and I loved playing them with her. So that's kind of how we got into it. As for Everdell itself, you know, I've always I've always been a creative person. Um, I was an author for a long time, and usually, if I got into something, I tended to kind of start creating it after a time. Uh, we we played games for many many years, and the first in the first year or two, I kind of scratched out some ideas for a game. Just would this be fun? Yeah, we'll try something. And nothing really hit. It was all pretty much terrible uh nothing was worth even continuing to go after uh at the time we were really into two games agricola and race for the galaxy those were our favorite games we played them a lot a lot sometimes daily and we liked them both a lot but there were some aspects of them that were maybe frustrating or we felt like we would like just slightly different and so one evening after we had finished playing agricola i i I looked at my wife and said you know i think i have an idea idea for a game and we began talking about it and basically the idea was to take our favorite pieces out of those two games in particular that's what really started it take our favorite pieces out of those and put them into one game combined Um, and then we would kind of cut out any of the fluff that we didn't like or the frustrating bits that we didn't want to have and that's really kind of where it started Um, I made the very first card on my computer on June 20th, 2012. I know that's specific, but I did some research and found out what that was. Um, And I I made a card, and it was called a farm, and I gave it a little ability, and I gave it a cost and a point value. I had no idea how the game was going to work. I just knew you were going to build some cards and have cards and make probably a city, and there'd be worker placement and this sort of stuff, and I'd figure it all out later. So, But I made a farm, and and to this day, you know, now the game's going to be published, the farm... Is still in the game, still the same point value, still the same cost, and still the basic same ability. 
that's uh, definitely did not happen for all the cards. I can promise yeah, you that. I was, I was gonna say, every, <laughs> everything else changed except that one card. <laughs> the farm is still there, man, and it's still <laughs> almost exactly the same. But uh, you know, and it just snowballed. I I I ended up working on the game for five plus years. And like I said, you can read in detail the the story there, but that's kind of what got everything rolling and got us to where we are now. So uh, yeah, when when I first uh, saw the, uh, the the game, like just the the cover art, and I, mm. even before I read through what it was about and stuff like that, uh, the the first thing that came to my mind was uh, mice and mystics. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, I guess that now their 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 new one uh, coming as a stuffed fables. I want to say I, I yeah, don't. that's right. But yeah, just the 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 I don't know, just, just the cute little animals. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, out in the forest, uh, you know the, the 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 trees made into homes, and mm-hmm. uh, but. Uh, so yeah, t- tell us uh, now. It's uh, it plays one to four players. So there there is like a a, a solo uh, aspect to it that you could play if uh, if people can't get all four people to come over and play it. Somebody could play it solo, right? That's absolutely right. Yep. And uh, that the solo was developed a little bit later um, after Starling Games had go ahead had signed the game. I I said, you know, what do you guys think about me working on a solo? is that going to be worthwhile? And they said, absolutely. If you can pull it off and do it, uh, there's a lot of people that like that. And I knew there was, and I'd, I'd always had in my mind the feeling like I could make this work solo. Um, and I think I could do a pretty good job at it. So I got to work on that head down and just kind of sorted it out, worked it out, played it, played it, played it over and over and over. Uh, so the solo version I'm really happy with it. It does a nice job simulated in a two player. It doesn't feel like a different game. I think it really feels like you're playing Everdell. Uh, but I really wanted your solo opponent to not take a lot of bookkeeping. So it's very fast. It's very fluid. And uh, it's competitive. It's challenging. It certainly is challenging. And I think it's going to, I think it's really going to give people a lot of life that like a solo game. Um, yeah, but kind of backing up a little bit, talking about the theme, because you were mentioning that. And, and this is outlined again in the Designer Diary. But. When I first designed the game, it was pretty much kind of your standard Euro setting, some sort of medieval setting of some kind where you're going to have these buildings and whatnot. And it was fine, and uh, the cards were certainly thematic for that idea. But when Star and and, and it kind of changed as time went on into a generic fantasy setting and whatnot. But when Starling took it on, they they loved the game. They loved the gameplay. They felt it was very, very, very solid, very strong, and they wanted just to see if we could push it theme wise really setting wise into something that was a little more unique and that felt very complementary to the game so uh, the main developer dan may at starlands he he approached me and and he through email and he said okay now now brace yourself but what do you think about doing this in in like a woodland critters sort of feeling kind of like a red wall thing and and having the critters build their you know their city in the in the forest and uh, and I was just immediately on board he didn't need to say anything more I, I loved the idea and it really fit very nicely with the mechanics with the theme of the game so uh, you mentioned mice and mystics and yeah we do have you know mice but really there it's not a combat game so it is different in that aspect and uh, we have a lot of different critters, a lot of different critters that are involved in the game. And that's kind of been a lot of fun, you know, developing that. Um, player, player range, yeah, the solo works well. Um, and the game plays, I think, equally well with two, three, and four. Now, I do have a favorite of two or three myself. Um, just four player can tend to get slightly longer, but if everyone knows what they're doing, it's not too bad. Okay. And, and uh, the the board itself is, is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. It's it's not your you know typical you know flat board, two dimensional you know. But uh, you got like a, I want to say almost like a a pop up book type of. <laughs> 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 yeah. Now, and what you're referring to there is the Ever Tree, and uh, that that is a an important thematic part of the world of Everdell in the game. And there is a card also that is the Evertree. But uh, yeah, there's an interesting story behind that as well. And kind of really what we wanted to do when we were starting to th- when we were starting to think through how this game could look, it was really important just every single area that we could to maximize on the theme of the game. 
in everything we possibly could. And the board was going to be really important that it it felt like it transported you to Everdell the best that we could. So step one was to think about having a round board as opposed to your typical rectangular square. Uh, just to kind of give it kind of more of that organic feeling of bushes and trees and branches and this sort of thing. And that it just was very organic and how it was laid out, that it wasn't just kind of standard blocks on where things went. We didn't want it to have your boring spreadsheet look by any means at all. It needed to feel different. And we had a couple pieces of the game that we needed to have on the board and to, and to kind of deal with where they were going to go. And as we were discussing this, again, Dan May said... I have an idea, and then he paused and said, no, that's too crazy, that couldn't work. And of course, at that point, I had to say, now, hold on, Dan, you have to tell me what you were thinking about. We're not going to leave it there. (laughs) And he said, I wonder if we could do a 3D tree. And there was that moment of silence, and then I said, really? Yeah, you know, and we talked about it with like, could we, could we really pull this off? Could we do this? And uh, and we, you know, we figured out a way to do it. And and through the course of talking through it, we decided this is a perfect place to put the deck of cards. So the deck of cards is going to be in your 3D tree, okay. And then up on the first set of branches up there, you're going to have these event cards, these little mini event cards that are common event goals that everyone's trying to achieve. Kind of like they're maybe posted on the tree. You could think about that, these events that happen. And some of these events are like the, the Everdell Games, uh, kind of like your, your um, you know, Olympics, or a performer in residence, if you're going to have a bard and an inn, uh, the capture of the acorn thieves, kind of these like newsworthy events that might happen in Everdell. And these are events that you achieve. So they're kind of sitting up there on top. And then all the way up on the top, one more layer up, is all of your extra little critter meat and you're going to be gaining these meeples as you progress through the seasons of the game. So, yeah, I, you know, it's a visual toy in a lot of ways. It, it just adds some coolness to the table. But it also does serve a purpose as finding a place for a couple of these elements that we wanted. Um, you know, and if nothing else, yeah, it, it, it looks fantastic. Yeah. It looks awesome. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's neat how that all comes, uh, kind of works together with the uh, just uh, – the, the theme as you said and also just the mechanics of the game and it just uh helps and, and plus it uh it helps uh free up some real estate on your on your uh table so you could uh make room for all the uh how many cards One, 128 cards here so <laughs> there's 128 cards in the deck and uh, there are 48 unique cards there so you have um half and half there as far as critters and constructions within the deck. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of game here. <laughs> there's a lot of different cards that you're going to be able to explore over and over and over. And, and you know, they don't just work independently. They they do combos off of each other, um, even three-step combos in some situations and more. And it, in, there's a lot of game here. There's a lot of replay there. But it's 128 cards for your deck, and so that's going to sit there nicely inside of the Evertree. There is room for expansions in the future, and also there's room for sleeves. Ah, so okay. if you want to sleeve your deck and you want to sleeve the expansions, we got you covered. It's all going to fit there. That was really important to us, particular to me, because sometimes I like to sleeve games. I know a lot of people really do. So we, we kind of measured how we would need to have it for a full deck plus an expansion with nice thick sleeves right. and we got room for so that all of that will fit excellent excellent yeah especially for a game that's going to be handled uh the cards going to be handled quite frequently yep. uh you know throughout the entire game that's really important yeah so uh t- tell us about um just how the how the, the, the different mechanics involved and how that the game plays out Sure, absolutely. So Everdell combines uh, two different genres. We're combining worker placement with tableau building. Um, so if you've ever played a game of like a Stone Age or Agricola, uh, that's going to kind of sh- show you worker placement, probably closer to Stone Age as far as the weight and the feeling of it. And then as far as a tableau building game, uh, the best comparisons that I have is Race for the Galaxy and Seven Wonders. Mm. So if you like any of those games or you like all of them, I think Seven Wonders, or I, th- I think the Everdell is really going to hit nice for you. And that was my goal was to take all of those and combine them together. So basically, what you're having here is on your turn, you're going to have a hand of cards um, with with fantastic artwork. Just have to say, so you're going to have this hand of cards, and you're also going to start the game with two little meeples. That's all you're going to start with. 
All right, you don't have any resources or anything. Now, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing cards in front of you, forming your city. It's a 15 card maximum for your city. All right, and so to play the cards, you're going to need to pay their costs and resources. So this is where your worker placement is going to start to come in. So in basic terms, on your turn, you either place one worker or you play one card. There's also a third option, which is to progress through the seasons, uh, but that happens after you've placed all of your workers, then you can have that. But pretty much this, this is all you're going to think about, playing a card, placing a worker. So it seems pretty streamlined and, and up front, and it really is, and that was kind of the goal. But where the complexity is going to come in is you, as you start seeing how all these cards can work together, uh, you're seeing the events that you want to achieve. And there's other places on the board, too, that are going to become important as time goes on. Some places that are going to give you points. Obviously, you have areas that are going to be more beneficial for resources that you want to gain. So you're going to be placing your workers. You're going to be gaining resources. You're going to be playing these cards into your city. Your city is going to grow. Your city is also going to, to adapt. There are ways to get rid of some cards that are in your city. Uh, you may have a dungeon, and you want to throw some of your critters into the dungeon uh, to utilize an ability that the dungeon has. Uh, you have some some, some cards that come into your city that are destination cards, places another place for you to place your worker. Some of those are even permanent destinations, such as a monastery. If you place one of your workers there, they are there permanently for the rest of the game. You're going to get a really nice bonus for that. But kind of thematically, they're going off to a monastery. And so that's kind of how it's going to play. And you know, it's going to build out toward the end. Uh, I'll talk about the season action here real quick. After you've placed all of your workers, you then have the choice to to activate this season or you could kind of think of it thematically as you're preparing for the next season in the game so how that's going to work is that you're going to bring back all of your workers that have been deployed out onto the board onto cards and then you're also going to gain one new worker and any green cards in your city are going to activate again and there's three different seasons you're going to progress through that are going to activate. And they each have a slightly different thing that they do. But that's pretty much what's going to happen for the season. So really kind of what that does nicely is uh, you don't have to worry about a first player token or someone gaining first player. Because that, the game is just going to continue to go in the circle away around the table. Each person doing one action. Um, so you don't have that kind of weird round structure that can happen sometimes where first player has a great advantage. That's just not going to happen here. The other nice thing is you don't have what you have in a lot of worker placements where gaining new workers is a predominant strategy simply because it's usually the best strategy. That's not a problem here. You're going to gain a new worker. You don't have to try and do it. And you don't need to feed your workers either. So really there's not maintenance to the worker placement aspect of it, which is something I kind of wanted to get away from. Uh, it's just fluid and it works nice. All right. That, 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 that's pretty cool, James. Uh, now, uh, tell us about the, uh, about the cards. Uh, there are like five different factions of cards in the game. Tell, tell us more about some of those. Absolutely, yeah. So, so you have green cards, which are your production cards. So how those cards are going to work is that when you play those cards, they're going to activate immediately, right away. So if you play a farm, it's going to give you one berry immediately. And and later, when you go and you activate the seasons again, those green cards are going to activate again. So that farm that you play that gave you a berry, it's going to give you another berry again. Thematically, you know, this makes a lot of sense. These are the these are the cards that are producing things. So they're going to continue to produce stuff throughout the game. So those are your green cards. You have maroon cards, which are destination cards. They serve as kind of a placement area for workers. So some of these, most of them actually, are going to be exclusive little placement areas that you've developed in your own city that no one else is going to be able to take. So you're going to be able to go to these and do certain certain cool actions, things that are going to happen. Uh, for instance, one of them is a chapel. So every time you go to the chapel, you're going to get another point token on the chapel. And then you get to draw two cards for every point token that you are have on the chapel. Thematically, this may represent tithing to the chapel or perhaps prayer or blessings, you know, these sorts of things. And so the more that you go to your chapel in the future, the more cards you're going to be able to draw, plus you're generating points there. There's some cool little things like that that work for your destinations. There's also two destination cards in the game that any player can visit in any city. You have the post office, you have the inn, and these have some really nice, powerful abilities. So if you visit one in an opponent's city, you're going to get to do the ability, and they will get a point. So it's not like you're taking away something completely from them. They'll get something out of it. So those are your maroon destination cards. Blue cards are called governance cards. 
These cards are just slightly kind of more complicated in what they're going to do. Some of them are going to give you a reward after you play a certain type of card. For instance, the historian is going to let you draw cards after you're playing other cards, sort of as though he is recording what's happening. And uh, you have the dungeon, and people can look up the dungeon card and kind of see how it works. But it, you're basically going to be able to put some critters into the dungeon and do different things with them. So the blue governance cards really kind of bend the rules and manipulate things in really interesting ways. Gray Traveler cards, these cards are activated once immediately when you play them, and then they're not going to be activated again. And finally, you have Purple cards, which are Prosperity cards, and these cards are going to give you endgame point bonuses based off of other things that you've built within your city and that you have done. Um, for instance, the the King is going to give you points for how many events that you have scored. He's going to get bonus points and that sort of thing. All right, cool. Sounds like there's a, a lot of replayability and a lot of variations of how things can uh, kind of play out in, in here and how you have to strategize or react to what's going on and the winning condition is. Yeah, certainly. That was that was the goal, is to, to just pack as much replay into the game as we could. And, it, it, you know, probably the reason it took me five years to get it to that point. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, just the amount of cards that are in there and then to play test them over and over and over and over to make sure that it that it balances, that it works, that it that really that it gives you the freedom to explore. That's really what I wanted it to be, is that I'm I'm giving you kind of a sandbox of cards here and saying, have fun with this, explore it, and it's going to continue to grow with you as you grow with the game. And it's just going to offer you a lot of different ways to play the game. Excellent, yeah. And uh, now just by uh, way of notes, uh, we're re we are recording this on January 18th. And as of right now, it's about a, uh, about a week or so to go left on the Kickstarter. It has mm -hmm. funded, so it is going to see the light of day. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, of course, we'll put links to uh, not only the Kickstarter, and, but uh, also the uh, the blog that you wrote for uh, Board Game Geek. And we'll put all those links in the show notes of this episode. <clears throat> now, the Kickstarter itself, uh, it's not overburdened with a whole bunch of add-ons and stretch goals. It's like, okay, you, you have two options, the collector's edition or the standard edition. I guess the the good news, uh, James, if I understand correctly, is this is not one of those things where you have to, you don't necessarily have to be a background Kickstarter in order to get the game. The game is coming to game stores, right? The game will be widely available in game stores sometime after, um, you know, backers get the game. Uh, yeah, certainly. No, it's going to be widely available all over the place. Now, why would you want to get in on the Kickstarter? Well, couple reasons you're going to get a discounted price at this point off of off of the retail um you're going to get the game earlier uh of course you're going to help support it and help us get towards some stretch goals but really kind of the the cool thing here to look at right now is that collector's edition right. um this, this has some unique things in it that that if you can get them later they're not going to be really easy or really widely distributed to get. There is plans that there will be a way to get some of this stuff at some point. But if you get it now, you're going to get it for a much better deal, and you're going to be able to get it definitely. Uh, so kind of what we have for the collectors at this point, before anything else is unlocked, which we're actually about to hit another stretch call at the moment as we talk. So, <laughs> But what, what you have right now is there's a 10-card um, expansion called the legendaries and these are just some really cool cards i've talked about them kind of in different places uh, but these are some some fun really powerful cards that you can introduce into the game maybe after you've played a few times they just kind of add some fun little more stuff to the game these are each going to have unique art they are going to be um, five unique critters five unique constructions and they're going to have specific names to them. So whereas all the other games and all the other cards in the game right now kind of have a, a generic name like the post office or the inn or whatnot, the these legendary ones are specific characters, specific locations. So they're really cool. You also have uh, 15 other cards, and the, this is what we're calling the extra extra promo pack. So this is six cards all together, uh, unique types, and these are just some really fun cards that, that you can throw in the deck right from the very beginning if you want to. They 
they work a little differently than some of the other cards. They do kind of some fun little stuff, some little twists on the usual. Uh, we haven't gone into detail a lot on those. Kind of want to keep them slightly secret and under wraps just because they're, they're fun, different little wrinkle. But all of those have been fully developed, fully tested. We're not just throwing in something here to throw something in. These cards are done and ready to go. We've had lots of testing on them. Collectors, so the collectors getting those. Collectors is also getting uh, metal point tokens which in and of itself is, is almost worth really the the up, and I think it's $16 more from your standards. So you're going to have some great metal point tokens. And we are unlocking some other stuff too as we go along. Um, a really, really awesome slip cover that's going to go over the whole entire box that's, that's going to be a gallery slip case is what we're calling it. This is going to this is going to shine. It's going to showcase the artwork like crazy. Lots uh-huh. of art on it. Really cool, exclusive, and awesome to your collectors. Um, and then we got a couple other things and some thoughts in mind as we go on. So, yeah, but you know, getting on the Kickstarter now is great to get it early to get that collector's edition uh, to make sure that you get some of those things that may be really hard to get later. Um, if you don't make the Kickstarter, the game will be coming out later this year. You will be able to find it at gaming stores all over the place sweet very good that that's that's ex- that's good to know and ex- exciting yeah uh, all right well uh i actually i, I want to try something different here uh, uh we're always trying to uh, improve and evolve as a podcast and uh one of the things i want to try uh and james if you don't mind uh, you'll you'll be the first one we try this with so it's basically sort of like a, a uh, called a Mega Meeple Rapid Fire round. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, if, any, if anybody has a better idea for a name, uh, just contact us and let us know. And uh, we're always looking for more ideas. But just just, uh, just a little uh, tri- you know, trivia stuff of that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with gaming or the game per se, but just gives uh, our listeners a, a an idea of who james wilson is as a person so am i going to be timed is this going to be a pressure thing uh no <laughs> oh all right i wasn't sure i was prepared so, okay go for it all right uh it's either or and just choose which one is uh, is more more applicable to uh your interests or your likes all right. okay number one cats or dogs mm. i have kids does that count <laughs> uh, we actually don't have any we don't have any pets i've had some some pets in the past and uh uh we we used to live out in the country and i had multiple cats and they left the house and didn't return so oh. yeah sad story for everyone out there but um i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna say in a pinch dogs if i had to get if i had to vote okay uh star wars or star trek who what do you mean by Star Wars? Uh, hmm. Uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's, uh, let's make a... Uh, see, this is how, well, how we grow and evolve as a... <laughs> we make things up as we go along and just adjust maybe, and adapt. Okay. <laughs> maybe maybe, I, can, maybe I can clarify it for you. So I was a big Star Wars fan growing up. I played actually... I actually played the Star Wars... Um, the Star Wars collectible card game for a little while in school. Um, so if you're talking about Star Wars Empire Strikes Back and maybe Episode Four, yeah, I, I would vote for Star Wars. Um, much else beyond that, and I'll probably go to Star Trek, but it's going to have to really be handpicking from the original series and then most of Next Generation. Uh, okay, got you. Yep. All right. That's where I'm at. All right. Uh, winter or summer? <laughs> well, I live in North Idaho, so I get both of those pretty strongly. Um, whew, I'm going to say summer. I like to play disc golf quite a bit, and okay. it's uh, you can do it in the winter, but it's a little miserable. So I, I'll go with summer. All right. Sounds good. Uh, action or comedy? Hmm. I like smart comedy, but I don't like dumb comedy at all. Gotcha. And uh, probably the same answer for action, smart action. And there's not a lot of those. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm not answering your questions very well no, for you. No, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Okay. Uh, and the last one, uh, beach or mountains? Mountains. Absolutely. A lot closer to Everdell out in the mountains. So I'll go with that one. There we go. All right. Thanks, James. Now, if anyone wants to find out more about uh, 
Everdale or uh, even as uh, you as a designer or do, what uh, where where could they go? Yeah, well definitely at this point go check out the Kickstarter for sure. Um, Starling Games, you can go look on their website. Uh, really the best place is just to go to Board Game Geek. I, I personally don't have any sort of active social media place. Um, I've done that in the past. I got worn out on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm very active on Board Game Geek as far as answering questions, and you can find me there. I am Gray Cloak. Uh, but if you just go and look in Everdell, I'm, I've posted on most every single forum there. I'm answering questions daily. So that would be the best place to communicate with me there. That's cool. Uh, that, that, that's neat that uh, uh, people have the the, the access and, avail- and your your availability to be able to uh, bounce questions off of and uh, get rather answers from people who oh I, I think the answer is this uh, no they're 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 mm. getting the answers straight from the source so that that's, yeah that's a big yeah big I'm trying to keep up with them uh, I mean there, there's been a lot of them which has been great the the Kickstarter really has been successful beyond our hopes and dreams which is just fantastic um and so it's kind of been a lot to keep up with but i love it and a lot of questions and there are a lot of good questions a lot of detailed questions and i try and get in there and keep up with them and answer them for everyone very much appreciate that and Great. uh thank you so much for coming on and looking forward to uh everdell and it's, uh, it's on kickstarter right now go check it out uh with this uh now this uh, show will be going live this weekend so if you listen, if you're one of these people to listen to the podcast right away, uh, you only have about four or five days left, so get on there. And uh, otherwise, uh, it will be coming to your uh, friendly local game store uh, pretty soon. So look out for it there if you missed the Kickstarter. James, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your time, and it's uh, it's really cool uh, t- talking with you. Thank you so much for having me, Thomas. It was great to talk with you. Well, thank you once again uh, for listening to The Mega Meeple. If you haven't already, we are on iTunes, so you can subscribe to the podcast there. Or if uh, you're not an Apple person, uh, you could go to our website. It's www.themegameeple.com and go to the podcast page, and all the episodes are streamed right there on the website. And that's also where you go to get uh, read their show notes and get all the links to the topics and things that we discuss in the different episodes. But if you are on iTunes, uh, just go give us a, a five star rating if you'd be so kind, and leave us a review. Uh, you can also go to our Facebook page and leave us a review there. If you want to follow us on any of our social sites. All the links to those are on the social media page on the website as well. And if you like what you hear, uh, spread the word. Tell your friends about uh, the podcast. Appreciate that very much. And if you've enjoyed the improvements uh, that we made to the podcast, uh, you can go to our Patreon page or our Pod Pledge page. Either one of those would be very helpful. And uh, helping us to uh, get better equipment, uh, like uh, like the lights for the YouTube channels, uh, recorder for uh, the, the Skype interviews so we could record our uh, Skype calls to include those in the, the shows. We definitely uh, appreciate uh, any help that you're able to provide in support of the show. I think as you listen to the improvements that we made to the the recording and production of the show, it's pretty obvious what uh, your money is going towards. And uh, we thank you so much in uh, helping us uh, make those improvements. Now, if you have any ideas or suggestions of uh, how the show can improve, or if you uh, have an idea for a topic that you like to hear covered, Uh, feel free to reach out to us and also if you are a game creator and you have a game that you would like to uh, get the word out on and you'd like to be a guest on our show you can email us directly at megameeple at outlook.com and uh, we'll see about getting you on the show to talk about your game so that's all for this week thank you so much for listening And we hope uh, that you'll join us again next week. But until then, we'll see you at the gaming table. 